Um, so we were looking at things that make us special, and one of the things we were talking about, of course, first of all, egotism, because we all, everybody understands what that is. And then this, the opposite of that is that if, if we're special, that means we're hot. The opposite of that is we're not hot. And that's what makes us special. We're special because of all of our problems and our difficulties and the way life has been dumped on us. and. The, the tragedy of that is that we then wind up complaining all the time about a situation. Of course, we know that there are people who have very difficult lives who don't complain and who somehow have disabilities, et cetera. I, I like uh, Helen Keller saying, uh, I, I thank God for my handicaps because through them I found myself, my work, and my God. I mean, my God, what a, what, a, what a thing to say for somebody who was both blind and deaf, and yet she found herself, in good part because she had to go within. <laughs> she had to go within. There was no out to go out to, right? And therefore she found God in that process. Remarkable situation. As I was coming into the city today, I was listening to a section in the Course in Miracles of Chapter 3 on the difference between perception and knowledge. And perception is the thing which keeps us very outwardly involved in the world because we're evaluating everything that we see. Knowledge, which is of heaven, is a total another dimension which doesn't even involve perception. It just, it's a, a, what the Course calls about a kind of pure knowing. That's the way you know God. You know God in a pure way and that doesn't require any kind of stimulation or anything from the outside. So that means that, that God is inside everyone and everyone can awaken to that knowledge regardless of uh, external circumstances. So we'll do a few more slides. It's quarter after now, so we'll go to four o'clock. So um, we're special because of our opinions. That's another way that we make ourselves uh, special. And comparison is an ego ploy. Comparison must be an ego device for love makes none. So love would see everything the same. Right? There's nothing to compare. The moment you compare, you've got judgment involved. Good, bad, pretty, ugly, nice, not nice, whatever it is that we're, and it's the judgment that becomes the problem. So the Course is very clear that there's no, there's no judgment in heaven. There's no such thing as judgment in heaven. There couldn't be because there's nothing to judge between. I think it's difficult for us to understand, but still, the Course is very clear that's the state that we're looking for. So love makes no comparisons. According to the Course, we destroy our motivation for learning by thinking we already know. Okay. So these are some uh, uh, quotes about uh, differences and opinions. Uh, does difference make a difference? So this is Francoise René de Chantonbon who is considered one of the founders of Romanticism in French uh, literature, said, you are not special just because you see the world in an odious light. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it's really easy to, you, you'll meet folks that just see the world in an odious light and that's what they want to talk about more than anything. The aim of our curriculum, unlike the goal of the world's learning, is the recognition that judgment in the usual sense is impossible. Totally non-judgment, right? This is not an opinion, uh, but a fact. 
In order to judge anything rightly, one would have to be fully aware of an inconceivable wide range of things past, present, and to come. Right? Therefore, you, you, you don't even have all the information to, to judge. I think about what happened with uh, this week with uh, Anthony Bourdain and killing himself and all sorts of cases. We have no idea. I mean, we don't really know. I mean, we, we know what the surface answers to that are. But those are surface answers. They don't answer the deeper questions. We can't really judge. And it's not our place to judge either. Okay. So no one can judge on partial evidence that's not judgment, it's merely an opinion based on ignorance and doubt. So if you wish to make a judgment about anyone, here's a simple one that's always true. Uh, this is a beloved child of God. This is my brother whom I love. Nothing more or less than that. That is true for every human being. This is a child of God just like I am and worthy of my love. And this one comes from uh, Voltaire, who says, opinion has caused more trouble on this little earth than plagues and earthquakes. <laughs> That's really true, right? Um, you probably know he was famous for his advocacy of freedom of uh, religion, speech, and the separation of state. Uh, and I like this one from, this is from George Christopher Lichtenberg, who was a German scientist who says, nothing is more conducive to peace of mind than not having an opinion. <laughs> and do you know the difference between a crow and a raven? I do that. <laughs> right. The crow has an opinion? Well, the difference, all right, the difference is that uh, crows have these four long feathers that come off the tip end of their wings, and they're called pinions. And ravens, rather than having four, have five. So it's just a matter of opinion. <laughs> that's not actually... <laughs> that's, not, that's not true, actually. <laughs> There's, there are other reasons. But there are only a few reasons. <laughs> ravens are a little bit bigger. They have different kind of wings, but et cetera. Uh, one, uh, crows fly in small groups, right? One of them flies in large flocks, and one of them flies in just little two and three ravens groups. Are ravens are singular, right. Right. Okay. Uh, I love this Buddhist saying, do not seek enlightenment, simply cease to cherish opinions. Wouldn't that be nice? Just cease cherishing opinions. Okay. And then we're special because we're uh, spiritual, uh, there's really no such thing as a holy people. Seek not yourself in symbols. There can be no concept that can stand for what you are. And yet we do seek ourselves in symbols. Um, so I'll tell you the two stories, the, the Zen student story and the four Catholic ladies, maybe you've heard this. So there's four, <clears throat> four Zen students decide to go into a week of silent meditation together. They sit down, a couple of hours go by, and one of them says, I wonder if I remembered to turn off the stove. To which the second student says, you idiot, what are you thinking? We had agreed not to speak, and you have spoken. To which the third one says, and now what are you thinking about? You too have spoken. <laughs> to which the fourth one says, I'm the only one who's not spoken. <laughs> And then the, I'll do the four Catholic ladies as well, all right? So there's four Catholic ladies who are having uh, tea together. One of them takes a sip of tea and she says, my son is a priest. Whenever he walks into the room, all the ladies say, good evening, Father. Second one takes a sip of tea and says, my son, my son's a bishop. When he walks into the room, all the ladies say, good evening, your grace, whoa. Third one takes a sip of tea and then says, my son. My son's a cardinal. He walks into the room and all the ladies say, good evening, your eminence. Woo! Fourth one takes a sip of tea and then says, my son. 
My son is a six, six foot two hard bodied male stripper. When he walks into the room, all the ladies say, Oh my God. <laughs> I bet you do, yeah, yeah. I can see why that would be true. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, a grace, eminence, a holiness, whatever it is, baloney for all, for all that, right? Uh, your honor, whatever it is. So, uh, David Hawkins says that not, nothing is deadlier than a religionized ego spiritual ego, right, a religionized ego, a spiritual ego, right? I discovered that in kind of a rough way of, of uh, what I, I described once upon a time as a really good person with a very mean mind. Eileen? Oh, you need the mic, hon, otherwise you won't be on film. You made a distinction once, and I think it was during the online course, but the distinction between the spirit and the soul, and the, the distinction I thought was that there was personality attached to the soul, where That's there's, right. there's no personality attached to the spirit. Right. And I wonder if you could just speak about that. Sure. Well, the, 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 the Course in Miracles very rarely uses the word soul. It only really uses the word soul, uh, for example, when it's like quoting something from the Bible. And, it, and th that word would be, be in that Bible quote. And the reason why it's really talking about spirit, because ultimately we're talking about spirit, so you might as well talk about what's ultimate. The soul tends to become a word that gets personalized. Poor soul, sweet soul, etc. So that it's, it describes the kind of personality. We're transcending personality. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a whole unit that's back home with God again, right? And, and it's hardly individualized. Right. You know, it's like, I have a... I have a soul, you have a soul. Right. You know, my soul's better than your soul. <laughs> yeah. You know, things like that. Where if it's spirit, it, spirit is inclusive. That's right. It's not individualized. Right. And, I just wanted to make, not a question really, but um, a realization that when you guys were talking about the religionized ego, somebody said, or spiritual ego, but I just kind of feel that there should be, a, like they're, they're not really the same. Um, I think, like, I don't know if there is actually a spiritual ego, because if it's spiritual, it's maybe beyond that. But the religionized ego, that's, um, yeah, that's treacherous. But right. I don't know if a spiritual ego would, if it, there is a spiritual ego, if that would really be in the same category? or No, I, I, let's, let's keep in mind that uh, there's no such thing as an ego. I want to make right? sense. So you, you, if there's no such thing as an ego, we couldn't have spiritualized ego or non-spiritualized ego, anything like because it's not, it's not even an entity in and of itself. John? I want to make some comment because I've been to some retreat conference and study groups. There are always people that want to prove that I am more spiritual than sure. you. And those people are not those people who never read the course. They may have been studying the course for decades and they can recite the book. But trying to prove I am more spiritual than you or this person is more spiritual, it's kind of spiritual ego in my eyes, and it's pretty common. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. That's just an, an ego that, that's called on to being spiritual. Are they still religious at that point? You know, like, it's just kind of strange. What I think is that um, the ego, well, let's say it is, the ego is, pretend, is taking over. The this, spirituality. Exactly. They're saying, no, 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 this is me. This isn't, you know, this right. is me. It's right. who I am. I'm spiritual. Got it. Yeah. I once knew, uh, I had a, a, a minister friend years ago who wore a very big brass cross around his neck all the time. And on the front of his car, it, in big brass, it said clergy. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so it was like, uh, that would be a spiritualized ego in that sense, right? An ego that was collapsed onto 
position in, in the world. And the clerical callers, too. I mean, that is really, um, that's making oneself special. And I used to wear a clerical collar back in the 60s when I first started in the ministry because I don't know why other ministers were doing it. But I found it was very distracting because uh, people are always staring at your neck. For one thing. <laughs> I remember getting on a subway once in Brooklyn and this, everybody just sort of backed up. You know, like, let the young priest in, you know, and would you like a seat? And <laughs> an old lady wants to give me her seat. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, but you understand what I'm saying. So I, I got rid of the collar after a while, mm. <laughs> except for a few special occasions like. Uh, Osho says uh, the ego is not your ego. Right. <laughs> you need. Don't forget, you need a mic to say it. But I got oh. what you said. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> no, I got it. We don't need it. She needs to repeat it. Let's go. On. So. Um, when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. This, is, this could be the sort of the, the theme for where we're going with this whole afternoon, right? We're just letting go of what we're, we're not, and then we find out something about who we are. So according to the Tao Te Ching, if we think we have some knowledge of the Tao, and that makes us better than other people, then we're not in tune with the Tao. Okay? Very simple. Or we may say, I meditate, I'm better than people who don't meditate, or I eat a clean diet, I'm better than people who don't eat junk food, or the worst of all is, I'm not judgmental, so I'm better than judgmental people. <laughs> so, um, here we are up to, you went to a talk on transcendentalism this morning or something, didn't you say? This is one of my... Uh, my favorites. So this is uh, Emily Dickinson, as you all know, was a great American poetess uh, who only eight of her poems were published in her own lifetime, and she wrote about 1,800 poems. Um, and I really like this one. It's called, I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Are You Nobody Too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell. They'd banish us, you know. How boring to be somebody. How public like a frog to say your name the whole day long to some admiring bog. <laughs> and beyond her. So reality, reality can only dawn on an unclouded mind. This is direct from the Course, Acts chapter 10. It is always there to be accepted, but its acceptance depends on your willingness to have it. An unclouded mind, right? To know reality must involve the willingness to judge unreality for what it is, right? which really just means letting it go. So we're really free of um, anxiety and worry. That's just the, the ego not having fun. <laughs> so to overlook nothingness is merely to judge it correctly and because of your ability to evaluate it truly to let it go. Knowledge cannot dawn on a mind full of illusions because truth and illusions are irreconcilable. Truth is whole and cannot be known by part of the mind. So it's the, this is back to our theme of the whole mind again, an awakening to the whole mind. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, St. John of the Cross. Uh, this picture on the, the right. Meister Eckhart. It's interesting, when you read the mystics, they often use words like desert and barren to describe their experience of illumination. Jao, that's kind of what you're talking about too, I think, and in the sense that just the, you got to get to this empty place. And once you get to the empty place, there's something there, but you got to get to the empty place first. Or this is um, a Spanish mystic, St. Teresa of Avila, spoke of the still wilderness or the lonely desert, those sound like, of the deity. It's the, you know, when Jesus goes off to go through his 40 days and 40 nights, it's in the wilderness where he's totally alone. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing there. There's no stimulus from the outside, right? 
And then finally, at the bottom, let me remember that myself is nothing and myself is all. That's St. Uh, John of the Cross. Who was, in case you don't know, <clears throat> just a little historical information, uh, was the student of St. Teresa of Avila. So St. Teresa, you can see her dates. She's 1515 to 1582, and he's 1542 to 1591. So he studied with her, right? She was the, the superior, so to speak, in this case, and certainly in terms of age. But they had tremendous, they were companions and uh, tremendous influence on him. He went through a lot. So did she, but uh, he did in particular. Saint Teresa is not Mother Teresa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, not the Mother Teresa. No, no, no. This is this is the uh, medieval. Okay. We're talking about 1500s here, the 16th century. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's important. Okay. <laughs> and this has got to be one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this comes from Angelus Silicius, uh, who was a German priest, poet, a physician. And he says, God whose love is everywhere can't come to visit unless you're not there. We are so there. We are so into our heads. We're so into thinking and analyzing, evaluating that there's so much going on. You gotta, if you can't get to this empty place, then you can't become receptive. I, I have said uh, several times when I've given talks in different churches <clears throat> that I, I think this quote should be on a wall in a church somewhere. It's that good. God whose love is everywhere can't come to visit unless you're not there. I, a funny thing happened. I, was, I gave a talk in Montrose, uh, Colorado several years ago, and I said that during my talk. I said, I want to see this on a wall in a church somewhere someday. And then we went to lunch and we came back and the guy who does the audio visual stuff had it on the wall in the church. <laughs> it was just projected, it wasn't really there. <laughs> okay. So the self, <clears throat> this is from the Course, the self you made is not the Son of God, therefore this self does not exist at all. We're talking about the ego now. And anything it seems to do, think or do means nothing. It is neither bad nor good. It's unreal. And nothing more than that. How simple can you get, right? And here we have a, a, our transcendentalist. Uh, this is uh, Henry David Thoreau when he was asked by his friend Harrison Blake if he didn't get lonely out by Walden Pond. He responded, no, I'm nothing. How are you going to get lonely, right? <laughs> if you can get to this kind of mind. It's just accepting mind, the whole mind. If the whole mind is there, you're not thinking about other people, etc. You're just appreciating what is. Thoreau said that he could spend a, a half a day just sitting in his doorway, looking, and just looking, and absorbing. You're kind of taking it all in. If you read Walden, there's a place in Walden Pond where he, um, it's just Walden, three-page description of ice. <laughs> just what he sees in ice. I mean, this was a man who was capable of seeing a great depth. Right? And this is one of my favorite quotes. This is from... Uh, obviously, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was uh, his, in a way, his teacher. Um, I say in a way his teacher. He was 17 years older. Uh, no, not seven, 15 years older, something like that. Then uh, 1703, 1803, 1817. Um, but it's interesting that Thoreau put into practice many of the principles that Emerson was talking about. I mean, he had a way of living them out. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But this is my, right, so here the, here's this quote. <clears throat> this is almost a perfect description of a mystical experience in, I think it's four sentences, and that's it. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed in the blithe air, 
and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of universal being circulate through me. I am part and parcel of God. So how does Emerson get to be part and parcel of God? I am nothing. I see all. First you got to get to I am nothing. You get to I am nothing and then you can see all. But in the meantime, the mind is clouded. Remember with the quote from the Course a moment ago? And you come to an unclouded mind. Right? And then, um, <clears throat> this is the quote I was talking about from uh, Aldous Huxley. Our task is not to be thinking, our task is to be thought. Right? Or the way he actually said it was, if you could get out of your not-self's light, you could be illumined. If you could stop anxiously cogitoing, you could give yourself a chance to be cogitoed. <laughs> In other words, if you could stop anxiously thinking, you could give yourself a chance to be thought. And that's actually what the Course is talking about when it talks about the difference between perception and knowledge. Knowledge is just pure, it's just pure awareness. It's, it's hard, I think it's hard to talk about it because it's, it, it transcends words. But there's a kind of knowing that does transcend words. We just know. It's like knowing that you're in love. You know, you're in love or you're not in love. And if you are, then you know it. So it's a pure experience, which defies language. But nevertheless, there it is. It's a knowing. Right? And then I love this quote from Wee Woo Wee, uh, whose real name was Terence Gray, by the way. Uh, he says, why are you unhappy? Because... 99.9% .9 of everything you think and everything you say and everything you do is about yourself, and there isn't one. <laughs> it doesn't even exist. In case you don't know who Wee Woo Wee is, I'll just tell you, this is a very interesting little story. So this fellow on the bottom right there, Wee Woo Wee, well, his real name, as I said, was Terence Gray. He was an English gentleman he owned an estate in England. He was a producer of theater in London. He produced something like 100 plays in the course of his life. Right? Uh, also in charge of the, like the opera. He was really a, a well-known theater producer in London. And, when, and he also ra raised uh, racehorses. In fact, as he had a one, Zarathustra was the name of the horse who won the Ascot Gold Cup in, I want to say, 1958, I think it was. And then after that, he disappeared. I mean, he just totally disappeared. And people didn't know what happened. But he turned out he, he went to India, and he lived with Ramana Maharshi mm -hmm. during that time. And um, he took on this pseudonym. Wee Wu Wee is uh, Chinese, it means a non meddlesome action, right? Non, or, or action without action, or non meddlesome action. So we got a Chinese lady in the front row, so. It means doing nothing. Doing nothing. Um, the Take, give, take the mic. Doing nothing means doing nothing. Doing nothing means doing nothing. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's why non-meddlesome action or action without action. Okay, very good. So that's, that became his, and then he started writing all these books, and the books became very, very popular, uh, and nobody knew who he was until toward the end of his life uh, he let it out. <laughs> that he was the, he was really Terrence Gray. Sort of a nice thing. Right? He, he lived, just he and his wife, someplace I forgot, in France or something, during the latter years of his life. He just went and went off and uh, he realized that the answer wasn't in the world. He had everything in the world. He had 
resources and money and uh, an estate and all that, but uh, he gave it all up in order to find out what was really going on. So, so anybody read Don Juan, the Carlos Castaneda series, uh, Beverly's on the front row? I was fascinated with reading the Don Juan Carlos Castaneda series back in the 70s and the 80s and even into the very, very beginning of the 90s. I think it's interesting. I bring up the name now and uh, most people, you and I, <laughs> it was a, he wrote four or five New York Times bestselling books back in the 70s and the 80s describing his life. It, um, he was also a totally anonymous. I'm talking about Carlos Castaneda now. Uh, he never appeared in public. Time Magazine once had a picture of him on the cover of Time Magazine and the picture's like this. It's like, <laughs> you don't really see who it is. There's just this guy with his hand in front of his face like that, right? But Don Juan, so Don Juan is the teacher, the shaman from Mexico, and Carlos is the student. And at one point, Don Juan says he knows all kinds of things because, one, he doesn't have a personal history. And Carlos thought about that, and he realized that that, that, would, that could be true because he didn't know anything about his past. He didn't talk about his past, and what, what little he did talk about his past, for all know, Carlos knew he could be making it up because he had no, no evidence one way or the other. He says he didn't feel any more important than anything else. I think that's a very important point in the course of not to feel any more important than anything else, right? All things being equal, we're all the same. Everything is the same, right? And, uh, and that should be a three. Uh, his death was sitting there right beside him. He says if you get a little too cocky, turn and ask your death, talk to your death. And death will say, I haven't touched you yet. <laughs> All right. So, this is in the Course again. Your past is what you have taught yourself. It's our story, right? When we tell each other our stories. Let it all go. Do not attempt to understand any event or anything or anyone in its light, for the darkness in which you try to see it can only obscure, right? So then we get caught in the story. Let's get getting caught in the drama. What if you didn't have a past? He says, if you don't have a past, you don't have to fill it. Nobody can pin you down in your thoughts. That's one of Carlos, one of Don Juan say. It's like, no story, you don't have to fill the story. The problem, you get a story. And once you get a story, then you gotta live up to the story. But if there is no story, there's a certain kind of freedom and a certain kind of, uh, about being sort of anonymous. You're present, but you're, you can't be pinned down that way. That's one of the problems of being famous, is being famous, you've got to, not only do you have a story, but everybody knows your story, right? And everyone has a story about you. And everybody, has, it's exactly, everybody has a story about it. That's why I say poor, Marilyn Monroe, it wasn't, she knew that she wasn't a sex goddess and all that, that there's something that Hollywood made this up. She said, and I went along with it and I let him do it. And, you know, she regretted the fact that, that it happened because the whole world, the whole world projected Marilyn Monroe as Marilyn Monroe. Still does. Right. Well, of course, it, yeah, exactly, still does. And <clears throat> if you, there's no Marilyn Monroe in heaven. There couldn't be. That was a mythology that only lasted for a little while. And Gene Klein, um, another mystic I'd like to tell you a little bit about, he was born in Berlin. He studied musicology and medicine. 1933, he moved to France. He joined the French resistance. He helped a lot of Jews escape from Germany during that time. And he became known really as an enlightened man. And at one point he was giving a lecture and some guy raised his hand and he said, um, you seem so peaceful and calm and serene, but me, I have all kinds of problems. 
what's the difference between us? And Jing Pling said, well, you think that you are somebody and I know that I'm not. <laughs> you think you are somebody, I know I'm not. Right? It's just, right? And anybody read Nasr Gatata? non philosophy, and this is one of my favorite books I'm reading right now. He says, I ask you only to stop imagining that you were born, have parents, are a body. See, what, what's a major emphasis in the Course? You are not a body. That is, that's a very strong emphasis on the, in the Course. You're, def, you're not a body. And will die and so on. Just try, make a beginning. It's not as hard as you think. <laughs> What we're doing here is we're just emptying out the complete emptying out of everything that we think that we are, and it's only by doing that that you get to find out who you really are, which is none of the stuff. That's what happened with Zhao in that death experience, that enlightening experience that she had. Is that a small book? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a... Yeah. And here's two contemporary teachers who are teaching the same thing. Uh, some of you may know H. Uh, Almas. He says, I learn a great deal of what I truly am when I'm not trapped in the particulars of personal life and history. I am then the unchanging background witnessing. And just the unchanging background, just witnessing. We're talking about witnessing as well. It's just, it's just being aware, just being aware without the drama. And of course, uh, Gangaji uh, saying, I am not bound by the story of me. Right? So we're going to spend the rest of our time, uh, our 15 minutes or whatever we got here, talking about awakening to <clears throat> the one mind. So what we've done, we started off in the very beginning saying that the whole thing is to remove all the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. The process is one of purification, cleansing up, getting rid of everything. We get down to that, and then we can become awakened. Seeing with him, the Holy Spirit, will show you that all meaning, including yours, comes not from double vision. Double vision is the agathological mind. It's the split mind. That's what double vision means but from the gentle fusing of everything into one meaning, one emotion, and one purpose. As long as you've got the split going on, Steve and I were talking during the, but during the break, the Course talks about at one point what it calls the attraction of God and the attraction of guilt. And the attraction of God is, for the mystics, it's all pulling us home, pulling us back to God again, and the attraction of guilt is pulling us down, pulling us into the body, and into addictions, and into thinking that something else is... And guilt is now, is the fact, guilt is heavy duty, because then, then you got to deal, there's no guilt in heaven. <laughs> that would be impossible. There's no, there's no sin, because there's no separation. Oops, this is a two-page quote, so that's why the arrow is there. The world you see is based on sacrifice of oneness. <clears throat> it is a picture of complete disunity and total lack of joining. Around each entity is built a wall so seemingly solid that it looks as if what is inside can never reach without and what is out can never reach and join with what is locked away within the wall. Each part must sacrifice the other part to keep itself complete. For if they were, if they joined, each one would lose their own identity, and by their separation are their selves maintained. So, this is the way the ego thinks. That I again, one of my favorite quotes from the course: "Divine abstraction, which is another name for for God, takes joy in sharing." It's the sharing that matters. It's the joining that matters. It's the relationship, and especially the, the one that's in love. It's not in, in antagonism, but it's, it's really joining. So thinks the ego. 
while you think that part of you is separate, the concept of oneness joined as one is meaningless. Ultimately, there's just the oneness joined. It's your one, your oneness joining with the oneness. Right? There's just one ocean. You're maybe a drip in the ocean, but there's just one ocean. Oneness is simply the idea God is. And in his being, he encompasses all things. No mind holds anything but him. We say, God is, and then we cease to speak. For in that knowledge, words are meaningless. That's all we need, it's just God is. So, it is your will to be in heaven, where you are complete and quiet, in such sure and loving relationships that any limit is impossible. Would you not exchange your little relationship for this? For the body is... This is the relationship we're talking about here. Little and limited, and though only those who you would see without the limits the ego would impose on them can offer you the gift of freedom. I think we're about out of slides. Let me just see. Um, okay, a couple more. When the body ceases to attract you, and when you place no value on it as a means of getting anything, then there will be no interference in communication, and your thoughts will be as free as God's. Talking about all the body stuff that you were talking about earlier, Brad, that uh, you see advertised in the, inter the internet and everything. In the holy instant, there are no bodies, and you experience only the attraction of God. Right? There are two poles, but there's only the attraction of God. You are the works of God, and his work is wholly lovable and wholly loving. This is how a man must think of himself from his heart, because this is what he is. Very close to the end. A mind and a body cannot both exist. That's a very interesting line. Right? Make no attempt to reconcile the two, for one denies the other can be real. Ultimately, all there is is mind. And let me underline the word ultimately. And it's, the proof of that fact is nobody lasts. Everybody disappears. And everybody disappears pretty quickly. Even if it's 80 or 90 years, it's out, out, brief candle. If you are physical, your mind is gone from you, self-concept, for it is no place in which could be really part of you. If you are spirit, then the body must be meaningless to your reality. So all, all there is is spirit in that sense. The spirit you can't get rid of. Spirit cannot die. Spirit cannot disappear. Spirit is eternal. The body is ephemeral. How simple can that be? Right? <clears throat> you who are part of God are not home except in his peace. If peace is eternal, you are at home only in eternity. And reality is everything, and you have everything because you're real. I think I've, okay, two more to go, I think. We cannot join with God or the Holy Spirit because we are already one with him. That's interesting, right? What is required is just the recognition of what is, all, what is already true. From our dear friend Ken, all right? You can't join with it because you are it. All you can do is remove what's not real. And then when you remove what's not real, what's real has always been there. That's it. Uh, one of the ways that we uh, often close, let me go back on this for a second, is that I do a little meditation and then we, uh, we will share in that prayer together. And I know you want me to move back into the light. Oh, bye. All right. So this is going to be about a three, four minute meditation if you want to close your eyes. <clears throat> and relax. Take a couple deep breaths and be very present. Several times, I'm going to say... I am one self united with my creator. And when I say that, 
I will, before I say it, I will say, say with me, okay? And then you say with me, I am one self united with my truth. Today's idea accurately describes you as God created you. You are one with yourself and one with him. Yours is the unity of all creation. Say with me, I am one self united with my creator. You are one self united with your creator, at one with every aspect of creation, limitless in power and peace. This is the truth. Nothing else is true. Offer to your mind with all the certainty that you can give. Say with me, I am one self united with my creator, at one with every aspect of creation, limitless in power and peace. Tell yourself again slowly, I am one self united with my creator. Allow the meaning of these words to sink into your mind, replacing false ideas. Attempt to feel the meaning that these words convey. You are one self, united and secure in light and joy and peace. You are God's child, one self with one creator and one goal. To bring awareness of this oneness to all minds. That true creation may extend the allness and the unity of God. You are one self, complete and healed and whole with power to lift the veil of darkness from the world and let the light of you come through to teach the world the truth about yourself. You are one self in perfect harmony with all that there is and all there will be. You are one self, a holy child of God, united with your brothers and sisters in that self. Feel this one self in you. Let it shine away all your illusions and your doubts. This is yourself, a child of God himself, sinless as its creator, with his strength within you and his love forever yours. You are one self, and it's given you to feel the self within you and to cast all illusions out of the one mind that is the self, the holy truth in you. Say with me, I am one self united with my Creator. You are one self with me, united with our creation in this self. I honor you because of what I am and what He is, who loves us as both as one. One last time, say with me, I am one self united with my Creator. And then we often share for the final, the, uh, this is what we call the Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles. It's uh, page 350 in the Course, and it's similar to it. So we'll read this together, we pause at each comma, and we take a breath at each period. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no illusions, and when none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the mind which you created and which you love. Amen. Okay. So our next time uh, together is uh, July the 8th, the second Sunday in July. We'll hope to see some of you then. Thank you. Bye.